so welcome to this talk, uh, Fussing, Finding Bugs and vulner Vulnerabilities Automatically. Uh, I'm David and this is Adam and we're from a niche company called Adalogix where we specialized in various forms of advanced software security uh, topics. And the work that we are presenting in this talk is uh, mainly work we have done in collaboration with uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And effectively what we will talk about is how we manage to fuss a lot of CNCF projects, a bit about what the results were, and um, that's kind of it. Uh, so, I'll let Adam take over. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, been fussing a bunch of the um, graduated and incubating projects in the CNCF landscape, and including these ones, I believe there are a few uh, missing, for example, Istio, um, uh, but, uh, but these projects are all being fussed. Um, and uh, so what we have done is, uh, we will go into this later, but, but uh, we have taken a bunch of the uh, amazing open source uh, capabilities into enforcing and brought this into these projects in various ways. Um, and uh, each project has been uh, different in our uh, approach because the projects are so different in nature. Um, but uh, part of this talk is to um, present that fuzzing works for so many different types of projects, uh, including these ones here. And that, that even includes different languages as well. So the projects are different than nature. Some of them are just like, well, I don't know if any of these are necessary libraries. Maybe Helm has some. But they are very different in nature, but also different in sort of architecture. So like language is different and, and so on. So uh, again, what is fuzzing? Why do we fuss? How do we fuss? And then we're going to present a case study focused on Istio. Uh, so in, the, in, in, in very general terms, fuzzing is a, is a way to automate test case generation. And that's kind of the origins of it. And what it is in practice as well from a more pra pragmatic perspective is a way to find bugs in software or a way to ensure that there's no bugs in software. And um, around 10, so fuzzing is a, is a technique that was used, maybe, maybe introduced, sorry, 20 years ago or so, but around a decade ago, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, there came this uh, improvement in fuzzing, which is coverage-based, uh, feedback-driven fuzzing, which essentially relies on uh, instrumenting the target program in a certain way, observing how the target program behaves and kind of driving this automated test case generation based on what you observe in the target program. So fuzzing is often referred to as throwing a lot of random stuff at a, at a program, where these days it's more sort of accurately uh, described as like a genetic mutational algorithm. And genetic in this case means that it improves over time. It mutates, it improves, and so on, based on what it, what it observes. Um, so the way, uh, the way testing is in practice is very closely related to how you write unit tests in essence. So what you see on the left is you have, uh, what you see on the left here in the test column is if you have a given API called my API, the way you would test it is you would give it just say three different inputs and you would hard code the inputs as, as such. Whereas in the fuzzing world, what you have on the right is you have a continuous loop that will, in essence, run forever or however much time you allocate to it. And you will call this uh, same function, my API, but instead of giving a fixed input, you will ask the fossa to give you some input. And the, the main point here is that what is returned from generate input will change. And it will change based on what it observes in the target program. And it will change that according to exploring as much, co as much code coverage in my API. So the goal is to generate a set of inputs that explore optimally all of the uh, code coverage in your uh, given target. So um, it's a code coverage exploration technique in that sense. And what you see uh, on, in the lower right corner is actual Golang code of such a fuzzer. Like it's really that simple, at least from writing the software point of view. Um, 
Fuzzing is something that is quite integrated into uh, like development infrastructure now. And it's not necessarily a third party tool that you, you know, download and install and then run it. But for example, in C, it's actually integrated into the client compiler. So if you want to see uh, fast C and C++ code, you have all you need in Clang. Uh, there's the link here uh, to libfuzzer is integrated to Clang, and there's the following link will take you to the exact implementation of the fuzzing within the compiler infrastructure. There are also other fuzzers for C and C++, but this is the tooling. So this is an overview of the tooling you would use for each different language. And you can see that we have both support for C and C++, Golang, Python, Java, and Rust. And this also encapsul encapsulates a lot of essentially uh, the projects in the, in the um, CNCF landscape, perhaps with exception of uh, JavaScript and, and TypeScript, which is uh, relatively new in the fuzzing world. So if you have uh, projects in any of these languages, you should be able to fuzz them with the given links that are on, on this page. So in memory safe, memory unsafe languages, so fuzzing explores code. And the reason you want to explore code is that you want to identify if certain corners of the code behaves unexpectedly. And what I mean by that is you aim to find bugs. And the type of bugs that you find depends a lot on the given language that you are fuzzing. Traditionally, fuzzing is mainly focused on memory unsafe languages because you want to find memory corruption vulnerabilities. So if you work in C and C++, or even in, in, in Golang, for example, where there's some, some native code, Rust also has that, uh, and so on, you, you, or even Python, if you have native modules for your Python code, you, you are going to look for uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. And this works in collaboration with sanitizers, we call them. Sanitizers are these types of bug oracles, such that when a given piece of code is executed, it, it is, you inject the, you can like compile the code with the sanitizer support, and it will check whether you read out of, out of a given buffer, whether you have a buffer overflow. You can see there's a list here, you will check for use after freeze, it will check after double freeze, which would check fault, but it will also give you a little bit nicer report. So we have different sanitizers, in particular in memory unsafe languages. However, in memory safe languages. Yeah, so uh, like David said, it varies a lot based on which language uh, you force in. And in memory safe languages, we are looking for, um, for s some uh, overlaps in terms of crashes uh, um, and panics. Um, uh, taking Golang as an example, we have uh, all uh, out of bounds and out of range uh, issues that can be caught uh, as in recovered, but they can also, if they are not, then they can be, uh, they can be issues for, uh, for, for projects that have uh, security relevance. Um, nil the references also can be called, but they also, uh, they, all, they can also have security implications. Um, in, in addition to those uh, language uh, panics, we, we can also fuss for logical issues in, in a program. Uh, this can be done via something like property-based fuzzing, um, where we set up a, cert, a set of rules, uh, logical rules that we, we that we and that we kind of set up inside the fuzzer uh, in the fuzz harness, and um, which could, for example, be that we expect a certain return value from our target API, and if we don't get that, then we consider it a, a bug, and then we we tell the uh, fuzzer to uh, report that as a panic, for example. Um, then race conditions. Uh, are um, troublesome in the uh, CNCF landscape. Um, the, the big run C, uh, CVE uh, many years ago was from a race condition, if I'm not uh, completely wrong here. Uh, but um, th that's something that fuzzing can also uh, find. It's an also an area where, where we can do better, and we will get into the future work in fuzzing, uh, but we do catch uh, race conditions uh, with fuzzing. Then off, off by ones, self-explanatory, and timeouts. Uh, timeouts can have many uh, root causes. Uh, they can be uh, severe, um, and they can have security implications, but they can also just be a matter of uh, runtime um, differences. So if, if you don't allocate enough resources to your fuzzer, um, but, but we, do, we have had examples of timeouts uh, being uh, assigned CVs, type confusions as well. 
uh, R issues in uh, in sa memory safe languages, but uh, not as big ones as in uh, memory unsafe languages. And just to jump in here, so uh, these are the very specific issues that you run into when you fuss memory safe languages. Fussing of memory safe languages is pretty new, maybe like a year or two old or so, where I really got into the mainstream. And what the security implications of most of these are usually denial of service. So that's usually like the dust, like you can usually catch, catch some type of like uh, availability issues in your programs. That's kind of the security implication of that. We'll get to something more where you can find, for example, uh, RCE and that type of stuff using fuzzing, but traditionally, traditionally as in the last two years, mainly looking for denial of service is what you can find with fuzzing in memory safe languages. Yeah, and uh, so we touched on, the, on it briefly, uh, that we want to, to be better at finding bugs with fuzzing. Uh, there are, like David said, traditionally there are bugs that we don't find with fuzzing, but we find by other means. And we want to bring those uh, bug finders or bug detectors into fuzzing um, to, now that we have the capabilities, that we have really mature uh, fuzzing engines, uh, we want to write new bug detectors to to find, for example, command injections and SQL injections, because traditionally uh, a fuzzer will not would not catch if you can s somehow execute commands in in uh, um, from untrusted input. But we can write and we will write uh, bug detectors that detect these things. Um, and they do exist. Like we we are writing them. So there there has been instances of where these uh, custom bug detectors have found RCEs. We recently have an issue uh, a CV in Golang based on custom box sanitizers. But it, this is very modern, as in just the, the last few months where this has become a thing in, in the Golang fuzzing landscape. Yeah, so David, like David mentioned, the last or the uh, two, two versions ago, the go, there were three CVs in uh, Golang, and we found one of them was found by us at Ada Logix with a custom box sanitizer with fuzzing. So it, it, it does have promise, and um, it will uh, go further in that direction. Uh, of course, quickly, disclosure of sensitive information. Um, traditionally, if, if you somehow disclose sensitive information in your logs or on disk, uh, a fossil would not catch, catch that, but that's something we want to do. Uh, we want to, to be better at handling files, so uh, arbitrary file writes and reads um, is something we also want to catch. Uh, th those are security issues for, for the cloud-native landscape. And of course, race conditions can also be done um, uh, better as well. So uh, let's have a short demo of uh, writing a fuzzer. Uh, uh, say we want to fuzz this this uh, piece of code here. We have selected this from uh, from Kubernetes uh, from the client go uh, part. And um, let's see here. We have we are in the in the directory here and. The API we want to fuzz is this one here, uh, which is the same one as in the slides, just cloned from this morning. Um, and this is an API that takes two uh, strings, um, a name and a text, creates a new parser based on the name, and then it parses the text. Um, so if we, if we wanted to, for, for example, fuzz this API for panics, we want to see if there's any input we can give it uh, to to cause a to cause a crash, this is what we would write, and it. Yeah. One second. And um, go through it real quick. We declare the package, the imports, and then we have this standard fuzz signature here. Uh, we are using the native Go uh, fuzzing engine from which was available from 1.18. Uh, well, and, and that means it's in GoLang. Yeah, so, so in a second you will see we'll, we'll run this by way of the Go binary itself, um, and, uh, which, which makes it very easy for everyone to fuss locally. You know, if I was, for example, to, to be uh, contributing to this pass, you know, I would be coding this function here, and I wanted to check, you know, have I ruined everything, and have I done anything to, you know, that can cause a crash. Then I would write a fusser like this uh, that uh, takes uh, testing.f, um, and then we run this uh, f.fuzz that takes a, a function here with a testing.t and to, and then we ask the fuzzing engine to give us an, uh, two strings, one we, name, we call name and one we call text. And then we pass that to pass, um, 
then it, so this parameter here will create the parser, and this is the part that will be uh, parsed. So which which of these uh, variables come from the parser? So th in with the Go uh, 1.18, we can get as many, or we can get many uh, parameters um, of different types. So th both of these come from the fuzzing engine. So we tell the fuzzing engine, give us two ra uh, pseudo random text, uh, sorry, strings, and um, then we use those here. So name and text are random stuff provided by the fuzzer. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and if we were to run that, we would use the Go binary like this, and we would run the fuzzer like so. And now the fuzzer is running, and it is mutating over the corpus, and it, it really is uh, that easy in Golang. And this is a completely valid fuzzer. It, it, uh, it will, um, it is something that you can use to test your code for, for crashes, uh, panics, and so. And we might commit this to Kubernetes later. And this will keep running forever if we don't touch it. You can see that it runs, uh, how much is it? Two million executions? Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. This part here, 109. Uh, 109, 100,000 executions per second, which means it calls the parse function 100,000 executions per, 100,000 times per second. And each time, name and text will kind of be different to what it previously were. You will have, you will have, uh, you know, collisions and so on, but in general, it will just be uh, 100,000 different types of input each iteration. So, why do we fuss? We, fu we fuss to find bugs, and do we actually find bugs? So this uh, graph you see here is the amount of issues opened and closed of the projects that we showed on the uh, first slide with all the projects, which means the more issues we have closed corresponds to issues that have been reported and then fixed, okay? So in June 2022, uh, 1,200 issues had been closed. That means the fusses of all of these CNCF projects had reported 1,200 issues, and they have all been triaged and handled by the developers and fixed and done deal. So that means that alone, the, the fussing of, C, of, of CNCF projects up until June 2022 had found more than 1,000 issues that were also fixed. Some of these will be false positives, and this is also because fuzzers essentially, uh, if there can be issues in the fuzzer, you can also over approximate when you call into an API, because it will be completely, like, it will be all sorts of input that the fuzzer gives you, meaning if you don't actually call the API in the right manner, you might break some things and it might be a false positive in a sense. So you kind of have to fuss according to the spec, according to the threat model of the given target that you are attacking. This is really important as, as it's easy to uh, some APIs may not be so well defined, and therefore it's easy to over approximate. For example, can you give a, a given uh, application any arbitrary string, or does it actually not want to satisfy certain uh, strings and so on? That's, that's the point that, that there will be a bunch of false positives, and this is kind of dependent on how, on who wrote the fusses, on how the, the project is itself developed, and so on. So this is a bit different from project to project, how they like to fuss their, their, their project. What is important also, uh, what is important as well to note here is 1,200 issues takes a lot of time to triage. So the CNCF projects have put in a lot of uh, investment in terms of time to actually handle fussing. It's a serious effort in terms of time investment. So another reason why we fuss, here are some, uh, some quotes from some uh, maintainers from some of the important, uh, like well-used CNCF projects around. Uh, the quotes come from a blog post we wrote, which uh, is linked at the bottom. And uh, Harvey from Envoy Proxy uh, says the following. Fussing is foundational to Envoy's security and reliability posture. We have realized the benefits via proactive discovery of CVEs and many non-security related improvements. Fussing is not a right once exercise for Envoy. And there are some points to take here, which is it's really important for Envoy, Envoy to have the fuzzing running. Envoy is written in C++, so there's uh, memory on safety. The second point uh, that I, I highlight here is that they also found a lot of non-security related issues. So you will find reliability issues. Not all issues find by the fuzzer. 
not all so like sec faults and so on are actually security issues. And the second, the third thing is fuzzing is not the right one to exercise. Envoys has put in hundreds, if not perhaps a thousand hours into their fuzzing uh, architecture. This is really important to keep in mind. And it's a continuous effort. It's not something you do, you know, set up once and then forget about it as the project evolves. It ca it's kind of like in parallel to, to, to unit testing and integration testing for that matter. Second quote is from Jan Fischer from Argo CD. Not only did the fossils find quite a few hard to catch and serious bugs in our code base, we also learned a lot from analyzing and fixing the bugs, especially that the assumptions we make while writing the code are not always correct, even if we think there's a proper unit testing in place. I think the, the, the point that I really want to highlight from here is that it also teaches the developers a little bit more about their code. It kind of let, lets them think differently about it because when you throw any sort of arbitrary random input on your, your application, weird things can happen. And as he says, a lot of the assumptions that you may have are not necessarily true. Um, they, there's more quotes in, in the blog which are quite uh, interesting from a developer's perspective. Okay, so uh, in terms of how we uh, set up fuzzing for all the CNCF projects that we showed in the second slide, um, we, we start by writing a bunch of fuzzers for the project, a bunch of uh, tests, and in the, in the uh, case study later, we, we give an approximation uh, as an example, uh, but it, it varies. But the approach is write a bunch of, uh, a bunch of fuzzers um, and run them locally to see if any immediate things come up. Um, after that, we merge these fuzzers into OSS fuzz, um, uh, uh, and we also build integration for these projects. So OSS fuzz um, is a project run by Google that will run all the fuzzers for critical uh, software projects, open source software projects, uh, continuously. And uh, some of the fuzzers will run for hundreds or thousands of hours. and. Um, it's uh, it's something that all the we want all the cloud the CNCF projects to do. They, we want them all to be integrated into OSS Fuzz, um, and then we let them run. We let the fuzzers run. Um, uh, Envoy, as an example, has been running the fuzzers. Envoy was one of the first uh, CNCF projects that integrated. They have been running now for two years, I, I think. No, no, five years or so. Five years, and um, the same goes for Kubernetes, uh, Argo as well. Um, they, 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 they are running for, for years, really. Um, and there are cases where bugs come up after six months of running, after um, 20 billion executions um, a bug is found. Um, and of course, that, that takes a lot of uh, infrastructure and um, you know, uh, yeah, CPU power, and the OSS host project offers that. And whenever a bug, bug is found by OSS for the maintainer get notified and um, with a re bug report and uh, a stack trace. So uh, in terms of getting started, uh, maybe you saw we were down at the, the project pavilion with the CNCF fuzzing booth. Um, and we, we get together with the CNCF projects um, in a meeting. We usually catch the, catch the maintainers in a Community community meeting and talk about how to to do this. Uh, you know how to how do we approach what we uh, said in the last slide? How do we approach writing a bunch of fuzzers and integrating the project into OSS for us? Um, there are there are different uh, opinions from project to project, uh, different ways of, of doing this. It's usually not a big uh, issue in terms of getting it done. Uh, usually it's something related to a, re a release coming up, and it might be too much to add a new thing to the project. Um, and, this, and then, yes, one after that, we, we, we do all the stuff, write the fuzzers, and integrate into OSS Fuzz. So let, let's do a, a case study about um, Istio that we, we did uh, around a year ago. I think, actually, uh, a, a year ago, we were writing fuzzers. So I assume everyone knows, knows Istio. If not, uh, it's a, a service mesh under the CNCF uh, that is widely used. Um, and uh, what we did was we, over uh, two, three, four months, wrote around 60 fuzzers and integrated those into, um, into OSS Fuzz. And just full disclaimer, like Istio maintains really, really quality code. Uh, you know, just full disclaimer that we, when, when we go into this case, case study. 
Um, so we wrote uh, 60 fossils random on OSS bus, and over the course of these four months, uh, there were almost 300, the, all the fossils combined uh, ran for, for almost 300 billion times, um, and for, for a total of almost 60,000 hours. And of course, that, that takes a tremendous uh, amount of uh, CPU uh, resources. And this is why you should integrate into OSS bus rather than running them locally on your machine for an hour every day or so. OSS will throw a lot of CPU on it. Right. So one of, one of the findings, uh, we've, we found a bunch of issues. I, I think we have a blog post on this on our website. Um, I think around 40 uh, crashes uh, that, that were mostly rel reliability related. Uh, but one, one uh, vulnerability was found, this one, um, uh, on an unauthen unauthenticated control plane denial of service attack. And it was assigned CV of severity uh, high, um, and it was found by uh, one of the fossils um, that we wrote. And in this, the, 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 the issue was found in this uh, API here, extract JWT out, that takes a string, uh, splits that string by, um, by dots, uh, and we then need to have, um, an, uh, end up with a slice of three different strings, um, and if not, we return. Then we, we assume that the, then we, we want the payload, which is the, uh, the second item of the slice, um, and we decode that um, into this payload bytes parameter. Uh, then we create a JWT payload struct here, called structured payload, and we pass the bytes into that uh, struct here. Uh, if, we, if that fails, we, we return an error. And then finally, we, tr we return the structured payload.out uh, item. And the CV was in here. And if, if you can uh, see it, um, then hopefully you have read the blog post that we wrote about it. Uh, but if, if not, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really interesting case. And uh, in fact, the Istio maintainers found this, the same mistake done in a bunch of other high profile um, projects. Um, so the issue was that if this payload bytes, payload bytes ends up being the a byte, byte slice of N-U-L-L, then- a string, still a string, right? Yeah, no, yeah, so, so oh, byte, slice. byte slice here. So, so if, if, if we had the, have the byte slice N-U-L-L and pass that to JSON on Marshall, and we pass a double pointer, if you see here, we pass a double pointer here, then uh, the structured payload will end up being a nil value. That's a, that's a feature of the Golang, and it was reported to Golang, but that's a feature and not a bug. So in fact, here, we, 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 uh, JSON on, on Marshall will not return an error. Uh, it will just uh, create a nil value here. So here, down here, we end with nil.out, and obviously that, re that results in a nil dereference. And that was, that was, the, that was the CV. Uh, assigned uh, 7.5, and the fix, don't uh, pass a double pointer, pass a single pointer. I think the main point of that is the ECU team had no idea that passing a specific type of byte slice could lead to that kind of very anomalous, anomalous behavior. And this is where the fussing really came in and tried all forms of byte slices when it tried the nil or the in ULL the issue hit. But Istio would never have identified this themselves yeah, so by writing unit tests or whatever. Right, so, so I think this, this code was one year old, so, so it, had, it had been sitting for one year. And um, again, I mean, the, the Istio team was like, they maintain really, really quality code, uh, and uh, luckily this was, the, this was the most severe issue. So the next thing, the next thing sorry, when you have started fussing up your, your your project, you have developed a lot of fossils. The question is really, have you done enough? This is not so trivial to, to assess. You can use code coverage as the main kind of like aspect of it, but even code coverage can lie because you can also reach different states of a given piece of code depending on which entry point you hit. So we have this uh, tool, Foss Introspector, which comes from OSSF. OSSF is Open Source Security Foundation, I think. And we're just uh, listing it here because uh, it will tell you a lot about the 
threat model of your project, how to attack it, where your complex code is, where the entry points, is everything statically reached? You might have a fossil that statically reaches something, as in, if you do static analysis, like technically your fossil should reach an API, but it might be blocked dynamically because of some configurations or so. So it can like overlap the dynamic analysis element of fussing with static program analysis. Looking ahead, well, more projects need fussing. So if you are involved in a CNCF project, visit github.com slash CNCF slash CNCF fussing and, and we'll, we'll write an issue. Uh, you should write an issue that you'd like the pro project to be fussed and we'll come and help you. Uh, there's also a lot of work in terms of maintaining the existing projects. Uh, also reach out on CNCF fussing repository if, if you're interested in getting involved. Uh, improved tool support is also one of the major ones, such as the one I just mentioned, Fast Introspector. And finally, also uh, improving the ability to identify security issues in memory safe languages is a really high priority for a lot of organizations because, uh, well, you want to capture these types of command injections and so on using these various bug oracles. One of the main points you should also take from this, the fact that we are improving bug oracles mean that all the fossils that are written now, whenever we push a new bug oracle to, for example, OSSFOS, all the existing fossils on OSSFOS will benefit from that bug oracle. So even if you choose to invest, invest in fossing now in your open source project, you'll get a lot of rewards from a, a large community that are improving fossing. Uh, so even though it might not, you will find some denial of service issues now, but the fossils themselves might actually find a lot more in a few months because we are doing a lot of work from the back end. Uh, if you are a CNCF project, reach out to us. And we would like to acknowledge a few uh, organizations here. First of all, most, first of all the, the maintainers of the various projects for collaborating, uh, the CNCF as well for sponsoring this work, and then also uh, the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund, which has also helped sponsor some of the fossil work that, that is going around. That's it from our side. Just wave at me if you have any questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to know what you thought of how do you keep the uh, how do you keep the types in check? So your example you gave today of the parse. Like it's just two text strings or two strings. Um, what do you do when you, when the fuzzy generator could generate a string that's a million bytes, and then you know your function could actually check for that and say if it's over a certain amount, you know we return error. So all your functions end up having to do lots of uh, bounds checking because the fuzzy gives the absurd values that necessarily wouldn't be be um, you know kind of a normal case. So you could do that and you could argue, well, the, the code's not right, the code could be improved versus you know, keeping it in check. Does that, that make sense? Yeah, I mean, in, in your given example, if you have something that assumes a string of maximum x size and you give it a string, if, and if you don't put that constraint in your fuzzer, so where, where is the issue? The fuzzer will give a false positive in a sense. Did the API document it? If not, the API has perhaps a documentation error and stuff like that. So now it comes to debate, where's the bug? And I mean, this can both be in the fuzzer, it can be in the description of it, can also be a lack of check in the function and so on. So this is the case where I was referring to some of them are false positives, some of them are not. And usually in it's the situation you described, you, you will talk to the developers. It depends so much on what they on what, what their, their view is, basically. Um, so this is almost a political issue in a sense. Uh, but in terms of, if we, if we say, if we remove the political aspect in that sense and then say, your fossils should also take a lot of, like, should take into consideration the code that, the, that it's testing. So in a sense, you should put the constraint up. You should constrain, you, you'd say, what you would do in this case, you would say, if, if the input given by the fossil is, in your fossil code itself, you'd say, the input given by the fossing engine, if that's longer than x, just return, don't call into the API type of thing. So you, 
you, you know, some fuzzes will be like hundreds of lines, 600 lines of code just to prepare this random input the fuzz engine gives you, do a lot of stuff on it until it calls into the target. They can get very complex, the, like the fuzz, the fuzz tests themselves. So, and that's like acceptable, kind of, because that's just one function. You would have to do that throughout, potentially, your whole code, code base, right? Uh, could you clarify a little bit what you mean here? Well, if you're dealing with strings that are super long, you yeah. might have to do that throughout. You have to write a library or something that says, handle these long strings, because mm -hmm. those 600 lines you're talking about, that long bit, the next function needs that same thing. Like, oh, I need to check if that string is yeah. really big, and that one needs to check, and then sort of, yeah, I mean, it is a lot of effort writing the fuzzes. You, you must study the code that you're attacking, in a sense. Uh, what you would uh, also, what you also often try to do is fuzz the functions that are very high level, in that these functions reach all the rest of the code. And if you just satisfy the, the spec of that, you know, high level function that reach the rest of, of your project, of your, of your library, then, I mean, uh, you should be good. So you're trying to identify those large, like high level functions and then manage, ensure that what you're giving it is what you actually should. Yeah. What I also mean by that, so for example, you could also fuzz stir length in C. And you could give it just an arbitrary, if you just give it an arbitrary piece of memory, you're gonna find a lot of bugs. And that's because it actually expects a null terminated string. So for example, if you fuzz that function, you should ensure that it's a null terminated string. So what you would do is you would take the input by the fuzzer, you would add a null byte at the end, and then you'd pass it in. So you do a lot of that stuff. You do a lot, a lot of that stuff. We even have some, uh, we have some libraries for how to do this in, in Golang. If, for example, you were to fire fuzz inputs, sorry, functions that accept structs as input, how do you kind of like take the raw byte given by the fuzz engine and convert it into a large data structure that is essentially random before you then pass it into your API uh, to your target? And Adam has a, a, a library for, for example, converting random bytes into a nice structure that you can then pass into your library. Great, thanks. Just a quick follow-up, but you can go on others. It's just, uh, how do you, uh, your fuzz, your fuzz uh, patterns or your, your scripts in sync with the code, you know? Yeah. You, what's the challenge that's there? The challenge there is it takes, it takes effort. You know, how do you keep, you should think of it similar to how do you keep your tests in sync? Yeah. And the, the answer is more or less the same. The challenges that there are from the fuzzing perspectives is that less people know about fuzzing. It's a little bit counterintuitive, like it's a not as intuitive as testing. So usually it's a mix of varies from project to project. Sometimes we will do it for the project if they don't have the, the resource available. Sometimes they will do it. Sometimes no one will do it and it will just, it's not working, you know? So, um, and then, then it can get very bad in the sense that it's not working because it's not working, it will start to throw a lot of issues because it's doing things wrong and stuff like that. But for some projects, it's difficult even to uh, maintain that the fuss is still built. Because, I mean, it's, it is an effort and uh, stuff like that, so. All right. There's one over here. Uh, but that is actually time. So I okay. would request to continue the discussions. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for the speakers. Uh, please, please come up and ask in case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So please come over to the speakers after the session and continue the discussion. Cool. Thank you. Thank Hope you very much. Everyone had a good few, few next week.